Hello, everybody. It's Mr. Sage again. Uh, today we're doing chapter four and chapter five. Uh, today is not a live lecture because I'm pre-recording. I will not be available to do the full lecture on our normal day. Um, I will be doing a uh, a small uh, live lecture on the on the day that's supposed to do, which uh, is Monday. So go ahead and um, take notes as we go, and uh, you can ask questions when we meet on Monday. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start with chapter four. Tissue level of organization. And here we go. Okay, tissue level of organization. Okay, last time we talked about um, kind of an overview of the entire text and uh, different levels of organization. So today we're talking about tissues. Tissues are groups of similar cells and extracellular products that carry out common function. Okay, what do we mean by extracellular products? Things like the non-cellular part of bone and the non-cellular part of uh, cartilage is a good example. Histology is the study of tissues and their relationship to organs. So we're gonna be looking at some tissues today. The extracellular matrix is the non-cellular material that's outside the cells that are produced by living cells. So. For example, what we call bone is the matrix portion of bone tissue. Okay, what are the four different types of tissue? Epithelial tissue is usually covered first. It always covers surfaces. Connective tissue is a kind of a grab bag of different kinds of cells and tissues. It's always found internally. It's used for support and transport. Things like bone and blood, believe it or not, are both connective. Muscle tissue always produces movement. We're gonna talk about the different types of muscle tissue. And nervous tissues used in communication, for example, our nerves and our brain. Epithelial tissue. It lines every body surface and all body cavities. So any place where there's not a cell directly attached to another cell and there's a surface. And when we say surface, we don't necessarily mean our skin. We mean like the inside of your stomach is a surface because there's a spot where the cells stop and other stuff is there. It forms both the external and internal lining of many organs. It constitutes the majority of glands. We're going to get to endocrine later. Composed of one or more layers of closely packed cells that form a barrier between two compartments having different components. That's a, another example of epithelial tissue. The key, one of the keys to epithelial tissue is there's little or no extracellular matrix, as there is in bone or connective tissue. A lot of material that's not cells in epithelial tissue, it's almost all cells. And no blood vessels penetrate an epithelium. So you might be asking, well, if there's no blood vessels, how does it stay alive? Well, it has to do with diffusion. We'll talk about that when we get to it a little bit later. Okay, this is uh, an image showing you the difference between simple versus stratified epithelium. Simple is one layer attached to a basal basement membrane and the basal surface. We're talking about the surface of the cells that's attached to the basement membrane. The key here, simple one layer, stratified, many different layers. So this is called stratified epithelium. It's called simple epithelium. This image is also showing you the different shapes. Squamous is flat. Think of kind of like a fried egg, squashed or squamous. Cuboidal, like a cube, is somewhat round in cross-section. And then columnar is rectangular, like a column. What are some characteristics of epithelial tissue? Cellularity. Now, I told you almost all of epithelial tissue is cells and not extracellular matrix. They're composed almost entirely of cells bound closely together by different types of cell junctions. There's a minimal amount of extracellular matrix. What is another characteristic? Polarity. Polarity means having an up end and a bottom end, up and down end. The apical or free surface, which would be on the top, is always exposed to your body surface, even, for example, the inside of your digestive tract or inside of your respiratory tract. There are intercellular junctions found between cells. We're going to get into those. And then the basal surface is the fixed or bottom surface, always attached to underlying tissue, usually a basement membrane, but not always. A little bit more about epithelial tissues. Attachment. The basal surface of an epithelium is bound to a thin basement membrane. It's the most common thing for it to be attached to. Another characteristic is avascularity. Now look at the word. A means without, and vascularity means tubes. So it means no tubes or no blood vessels. There's no blood vessels in this tissue. The nutrients are obtained either directly across the apical surface or by diffusion across the basal surface. So the key is blood vessels are near this material, near these cells, 
but don't penetrate directly. So all of the oxygen and nutrients that get to these cells come through diffusion up from the underlying tissue, which does have blood vessels. Innervation means having nerves. Some epithelia are richly innervated to detect changes in the environment at that body or organ surface. For example, our skin has lots of nerve cells in it so that we can sense our environment. Most nervous tissue is in the underlying connective tissue. Now, why is this the case? Because nerves require lots of food and oxygen, so you're not gonna find them in dead tissue. Now, you may have heard of our epidermis being dead. It's only partly true. Uh, the lower levels are alive, the outer surface is dead, but where would you find the nerve cells? You'd find it in the living portion. So nerves tend to be found in the more living part of epithelium and not the dead part. Okay the ability to regenerate quickly. I don't know if you've ever noticed, if you ever get a small cut in your mouth, it heals pretty quickly. Epithelial tissue heals quickly. Now, you may think that cuts that you get on your skin don't heal quickly, but compare how quickly they heal to that of, let's say, a bone or cartilage, much, much faster. This tissue is frequently damaged or lost by abrasion, which means scraping, and it's replaced by high regenerative capacity. Now, how does this happen? You may have heard of a process called mitosis, cell division. Cell division happens quickly in epithelial tissue because it needs to be repaired quickly because that's what's really protecting. Um, Continuing replacement occurs through the divisions, the deepest epithelial cells called stem cells. And you might have heard of stem cells. Stem, stem cells can divide, become lots of different kinds of cells near the base of the epithelium. What are some of the functions of the epithelial tissue? It can be protection of underlying tissues. For example, skin protects the tissue below it. It can be the re regulation of materials into and out of the organ or tissue. For example, the epithelial lining of your stomach regulates water, alcohol, things like that getting into your blood. And it can produce secretions or excretions. So if there's endocrine glands, um, endo means inside. So these uh, glands produce what are called secretions, which go into bodily fluids like your blood. Exocrine glands go to body surfaces, for example, sweat. Sweat goes to your body surface, so that's clearly exocrine. Exo means outside. What are some functions of epithelial tissue? Well, it can provide sensations. Nerve endings detect changes in the external environment at their surface. It continually supplies information to the nervous system concerning touch, pressure, temperature, and pain. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we have epithelial tissue to sense our environment. What are some of the junctions that I mentioned earlier? Well, there's four types of cell junctions. There's tight junctions, which are found in the apical surface that join cells to each other, sealing the surface, keeping uh, water loss from happening. Adhering junctions are found more near the middle of cells. They have a strong structural connection, physically holding them together. Uh, desmosomes are similar to buttons that connects adjacent cells without sealing, so materials can flow between that space. And then gap junctions form pores, allowing material to pass from one cell to the other. So think of it as like a little porthole between cells. Okay, and these are showing some of those uh, junctions there. Not a big focus of my test, but at least it shows you some of the pictures. Okay, what are some classifications of epithelial tissues? Well, I mentioned earlier, simple means one cell layer. Stratified means many layers. Skin, for example, is stratified squamous epithelium. Interestingly about skin, it's more cuboidal at the base and more, more, uh, more squamous at the surface. But because the uppermost layers are squamous, it's called stratified squamous epithelium. Pseudo-stratified is an interesting term. Pseudo means falsely, and stratified means layer. So even though it looks like many layers, uh, it's not. It has one basement membrane, one apical surface, but because the nuclei are staggered up and down, it looks like it has different layers, but it's not, it's called falsely stratified. Now looking at shape, I mentioned before, squamous is flat. Think of it as kind of like a, if you fried an egg, cut it on edge and looked at the edge of it, it would look flat. Cuboidal is square or round. It doesn't always have kind of perfectly square edges, more rounded. And columnar uh, is rectangular. Uh, don't worry about this, the types of evidence from a previous text. Okay, so this shows you some of these shapes. There's cuboidal, somewhat square. Uh, these are Columnar looking more uh, taller than they are wide. This is stratified squamous. These look kind of flat to me. And stratified means multiple layers. And then inside your nose, we have pseudo stratified. Now, it looks like there's lots of layers, but there isn't. It's just that some nuclei are high, some are low. There's single basement membrane, single apical surface, pseudo stratified. 
Let's talk about some glands, individual cells or multicellular organs that produce substances needed in or on the body. There are some glands that produce sweat and oil at the surface. Most glands produce materials to go into your blood. They can be endocrine for use in the body or exocrine for on the outside of the body. They produce substances such as mucus, hormones, enzymes, and waste products. Waste products we're going for are like sweat. Okay, endocrine glands. They don't have ducts because the glands dump their material directly into blood. Now, what is a duct? For? Well, if you have a gland here and the surface of the skin is way up here, the gland has to be down where there's blood and the surface is way up here. And so you have to travel from the gland all the way up to the surface. That's called a duct or a tube that leads from the gland all the way up to the surface. So endocrine glands don't have that because it dumps it directly into the blood. The bloodstream comes right by and it drops it there. Most endocrine glands produce hormones that act as chemical messengers to influence cell activities elsewhere in the body. You may have heard of it. Things like testosterone, estrogen affect body tissues. We go into that in a lot more detail in physiology if you end up taking that with me. Exocrine glands usually maintain their contact with the epithelial surface by means of a duct, which is, as I told you, a tube leading from the gland to the surface. The duct secretes materials onto the surface of the skin or onto an epithelial surface lining an internal passageway. Most longer ducts are found through the skin. They can be unicellular, for example, goblet cells that we saw on that pseudostratified columnar epithelium from an earlier slide. Mucus without ducts or multicellular, most other with ducts. So what are some exocrine glands? Well, sweat, milk. Now, why would you say milk is? Well, milk is not produced to be kept inside the mother's body. It's meant to go outside her body into somebody else, the baby. And so that's why it's called exocrine. It's not a waste. It just means it going to the outside of the body. Saliva. And you might think, well, it's going into your mouth. Isn't that the inside? No. It turns out that your mouth and even the inside of your stomach, the space of your stomach, is physiologically outside your body. So saliva is considered exocrine. Because even though you end up swallowing it, the space inside your mouth is anatomically and physiologically outside your body. And then skin oil, scientifically called sebum. Okay, what are some secretion types? Serous glands produce and secrete a non-viscous, that means non-sticky, watery fluids such as sweat, milk, tears, or digestive juices. Serous means mostly watery. Mucus secrete mucin, which is a protein, which forms mucus when mixed with water. So mucus formed from mucus glands. Mixed glands, such as the two pair of salivary glands, contain both serous and mucus cells and produce a mixture of the two types of secretions. So your saliva has some mucus in it and some serous secretions in it, which gives us our saliva. Merocrine glands. Okay, merocrine glands are interesting. Take a look at this picture. What we're noticing here is that these little vesicles, which are these bubbles, are making their way to the surface of the cell and dumping their products into this gap. And then it makes its way up. Notice that none of the cell is actually destroyed here. It's just producing something and dumping. They're also called eccrine glands, so you might want to know that. In some situations on my tests, I might have two right answers. So, for example, if I describe this gland and I say, what is that called? There would be a right answer, eccrine, and the right answer, merocrine. So you would want to know both of those for the test. Travels to the apical, which is the surface. This is the top or surface level and they release their secretion by exocytosis. Exocytosis is the docking of these little bubbles with the surface and dumping what's inside the bubble to the lumen or hollow spot. The glandular cells remain intact and not damaged in any way, so none of the cell is destroyed by, by this. That's called a merocrine or eccrine gland secretion. Holocrine gland. Holocrine gland is the opposite. Now notice these cells in this picture are actually breaking up basically committing suicide and turning into the excretion in this case. Secretion or excretion, in this case it's an excretion, is produced through the destruction of the secretory cell. So these cells are full of oil, and when they rupture, all that oil comes out and makes its way onto the surface, and that's what makes our hairs flexible and our skin flexible and somewhat water resistant. The lost cells are replaced by cell division at the base of the gland. And you can see right here at the base of the gland, this is mitosis happening. So as these cells get destroyed on the surface, they get replaced on the bottom. So there's constantly replacing cells that are broken up. So these cells become basically big bags of oil that break up and make their way to the surface. An apocrine gland is kind of in between the two. The apex or top surface is what breaks off. And you can see these cells here, the top part of it is pinching off 
and becoming the secretions. Yet the cells at the bottom are okay because only part of them is breaking through. The secretion occurs with the decapitation or cutting off of the apical surface of the cell and subsequent release of secretory product and some cellular fragments. Examples, the mammary glands and some sweat glands in the axillary and pubic regions. I think you might find this interesting, but mammary glands and sweat glands in your armpits and pubic areas have a similar secretion. Well, if you've ever noticed yourself sweating from your armpits, you might have noticed that that sweat is different than the sweat that comes out the rest of your body. That's because it contains food molecules. You think, well, why would you want to have food molecules in your armpit sweat? Well, that's one of the reasons why your armpits end up smelling so bad if you don't wash your armpits or use deodorant and antiperspirant. One of the interesting things about that, we're going to get to that later, is that that scent that comes from your armpits and your groin is really useful or used to be useful to our ancestors to give information from one person to another about their reproductive status and relationship status. Basically, are you related? Are you part of this group? Are you reproductively active? Things like that. We're going to talk more about that later. Connective tissue. It's the most diverse, abundant, and widely distributed and microscopically variable of the tissue. So connective tissue is kind of like a varied grab bag, of very different kinds of cells, mostly put in there because they didn't belong anywhere else. They're not muscular. They're not nervous. They're not uh, epithelial. So they got to be connective. It's all the cells that don't belong elsewhere. They're designed to support, protect, and bind organs. It binds body structures together. Think of like connective tissue holding your organs together. Never found on a body surface. The only exception to that is your teeth. Your teeth are on the surface and they're a form of connective tissue. But uh, just because the teeth are there doesn't, doesn't it, it mean that this statement is not false. So teeth are an exception to this rule. So bones, cartilage, blood, loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue are all connective tissues and generally found only on the inside of your body. What are some basic components of connective tissue? The tissue share three basic components, the cells that are living, the protein fibers which hold it all together, and the ground substances, anything between the cells that's not protein fiber. Now please make a note, when you mix ground substance and protein fibers together, you get the matrix. The matrix is anything outside the cells. So you have cells and matrix, and matrix is made of the fibers and this ground substance, which in bone is hard and cartilage is flexible. What are some cells of the uh, connective tissue? Connective tissue proper contains what are called fibroblasts. Now fibroblasts produce the fibers that you find in connective tissue. That contains cells called adipocytes. You guys have probably heard of adipose tissue. It's because adipose tissue is made up of adipocytes, which means fat cells. Cartilage contains chondrocytes, which means cartilage cells, and bone contains osteocytes. Osteo means bone, site means cell. So osteocytes are bone cells. Now, osteocyte is a general term. There's different types of osteocytes. Many con connective tissues contain white blood cells, such as macrophages, which phagocytize or swallow foreign materials. So some connective tissues have have uh, white blood cells in there to help keep uh, foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. Okay, protein fibers. Most connective tissue contains protein fibers throughout the tissue. That's what makes it strong. It strengthens and supports the connective tissue. The type and abundance of these fibers varies depending on what the function of the connective tissue is. They're going to be a lot fewer. Do they run parallel? Do they run like a net? It depends. There's three basic types of protein fibers. Collagen fibers are strong and stretch resistant. Now, you guys have probably heard about people get collagen injections. It's because as we age, the amount of collagen in our skin diminishes. And so the more collagen you have, the more strength and elasticity, not so much elasticity, mostly strength you have in your skin. Elastic fibers are flexible and resilient. They stretch and snap back. Reticular fibers form an interwoven framework. One of the things we have in our skin is like this net, a net of protein fibers woven together so that when somebody pinches our cheek like our favorite ant and pulls, it doesn't just yank our skin off. So the reticular fiber provides most of the strength of epithelial tissue. There are no fibers found in the blood except when what? Well, when we get cut. Now, if you get cut, that means you've been injured. Please make a note of that. Just because you're bleeding, if you're bleeding outside a doctor's office, you usually mean that there's been some kind of injury, internal or external. So please make a note, 
when you're bleeding, you're probably been injured. Now, there's some exceptions, of course, like menstrual bleeding is not an injury. And when you're having your blood drawn, that's not an injury. But by definition, somebody's poked a hole in your skin, which is an injury. So make a note of that. Ground substance. Ground substance, uh, the cells and the protein fibers reside within a material called ground substance. Now, this is all the material that's not cells or protein fibers. The non-living material is produced by the connective tissue cells, which are called, uh, often called fibroblasts. Primarily consists of molecules composed of protein and carbohydrate in variable amounts of water. So in like bone, not as much water, cartilage a little bit more, and other types of connective tissue is going to be quite a bit more water. For example, blood is 50% water, approximately. It can be viscous, which means kind of thick, thick liquid. You guys know what the consistency of blood is. Semi-solid, which means kind of rubbery, like cartilage, or solid, and which is bone. What are some functions of connective tissue? Well, physical protection, for example, bone. Supporting a structural framework, like forming the shape of an organ, like your kidney, your liver. Binding of structures, holding your bones together, like ligaments and tendons. Storage. Uh, fat is a connective tissue and it stores energy. Your bones also store calcium and phosphorus that your body needs for other things. Now, you may not know that the calcium and phosphorus in your bones is necessary for physiological functions, such as nerve communication or blood clotting. But your bones actually act as a reservoir of these chemicals that your body needs. And transport is almost all blood. Transports uh, oxygen, food, and waste. Classification of connective tissue. The connective tissue types present after birth are classified into three broad categories. The connective tissue proper, which is the main part, supporting connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue, which is what we're talking about when we talk about blood. The resident cells of the connective tissue proper. Now, fibroblasts, as I mentioned, produce the fibers and ground substance of the matrix. So fibroblast means, blast, by, by the way, this, this suffix here means to build. So it means the builders of fibers. So they produce the fibers and the non-fibrous part of the connective tissue. Adipocytes are fat cells. Fixed macrophages mean non-moving white blood cells. WBCs are white blood cells. Mesenchymal cells are stem cells that can divide and replace lost tissue. So when you need to heal, these stem cells will divide and replace all of the damaged tissue. If you don't have enough of those, you form scar tissue. All right, wandering cells, so the moving cells. Mast cells secrete heparin, which prevents blood clotting, and histamines. So you guys have probably heard of antihistamines, right? When you get pollen inside your you know, nose, et cetera, the mast cells release a lot of histamines, which causes inflammation. So when you take an antihistamine, it blocks the histamines. And what do histamines do? They basically allow blood vessels to open up, the gaps to form, and that causes our tissue to swell up. So swelling is formed from histamines. And that's not always bad. We just don't like to have it happen to us. Plasma cells produce antibodies to fight pathogens. We'll talk more about that in physiology. Macrophages are white blood cells that engulf pathogens through phagocytosis. It means basically wrapping around something and engulfing it and swallowing it and digesting it. There are other types of leukocytes vary. The variety of other white blood cells that are used in immunity. We do have a chapter on blood, so we'll get to the different kinds of blood white blood cells uh, when we get to that chapter. There are two broad categories of connective tissue. There's loose connective tissue, which means it's not tightly formed, not tightly packed with fibers. The first is called areolar. It's very common at cushion shocks. You find that like places like behind your eye and in your knee. Adipose contains fat cells. Even the slimmest people have some of those because that's what you find in the center of your long bones. The hollow spot of your bones is full of fat for everybody. And then reticular forms a framework for many organs. So it forms like the shape of your kidney, the shape of the liver, and then the living cells pack into that uh, framework of the reticular tissue. Now, dense connective tissue is primarily protein fibers, fewer cells, much less ground substance, almost all protein fibers. So in dense regular connective tissue, there's parallel fibers to the tendons that hold your bones together, uh, excuse me, that, that hold your uh, <laughs> muscles to your bones, excuse me. Dense irregular means the fibers go in all different directions. As I told you, your dermis is kind of like a web. And then elastic connective tissue has branching elastic fibers. Think of them like rubber bands. Your vocal cords and ligaments ligaments connect bone to bone. Now, the question is, why do you have to have elastic material in the connections between your bones? Well, if they weren't elastic, you wouldn't be able to move your joints, right? The fact that it can 
change length, think of it kind of like a rubber band, a tough rubber band, but the ability to be stretched, supporting connective tissue. Cartilage and bone are a good example of that. It forms a strong, durable framework that protects and supports the soft body tissue. The extracellular matrix contains many protein fibers and a ground substance that ranges from semi-solid in cartilage to solid in bone. Here's a picture of cartilage. You can see the cells are these little circles here, and everything in between it is what is called the matrix. Remember, the matrix is made up of ground substance plus protein fibers. It's a, it has a firm extracellular matrix of protein fibers and ground substance. So even if it feels kind of like a plastic, it's still flexible. The living cells are called chondrocytes. And you can see the chondrocytes are these living cells found within holes called lacuna. So the hole is the lacuna. The cell is chondrocyte. Chondro means cartilage. Site means cell. Stronger and more flexible than other types of connective tissue, but not rigid. Cartilage generally isn't rigid. It can bend. Bone generally doesn't bend. Found in areas of the body that need flexible support and cushioning, like in between the joints, uh, in between the bones of your joints and the tip of your nose. Don't worry about this last line. This is only for on-campus students. Okay, bone. This is what bone looks like under the microscope. It's also known as osseous tissue. Osseo, yeah, the prefix means bone. It's much more rigid and inflexible. The key is you want really strong, solid uh, protection. It's one third organic materials, primarily collagen fibers, and two thirds inorganic components, calcium salts, uh, water. And uh, what does the calcium do? It provides weight bearing strength. Think of reinforced concrete. So we have collagen fibers, which make your bone less likely to crack. And then the calcium salts give it that compression force. They possess a periosteum, which peri means around, osteum means bone, it means it's a, a layer of connective tissue and living cells that surround the bone. This is one of the ways your bone heals after a break. And again, don't worry about on your own and in lab. Uh, fluid connective tissue, blood is the fluid connective tissue composed of cells called formed elements. Now, why are they called formed elements? Because not all of them are cells. Interestingly, red blood cells are not really cells, and I'll explain why either in this chapter or when we get to the chapter on blood. The only true proper cells in blood are white blood cells. Why is that? Because white blood cells have a nucleus, red blood cells don't. Platelets aren't cells at all, they're just little fragments that help with clotting. So erythrocyte is the scientific term for red blood cell. Leuco means white, leukocytes are white blood cells, and platelets are for clotting. Erythrocytes are red blood cells, transport oxygen between the lungs and the body tissues. That's what they're there for. Leukocytes mount an immune response, which is immunity, and platelets are involved in blood clotting. Muscle tissue. It responds to stimulation from the nervous system, causing them to shorten. Now, some muscle cells, like smooth muscle, can actually respond to other things other than a nerve signal, but we'll get to that when we get to smooth muscle. They produce both voluntary and involuntary movements. So voluntary would be like moving your arm. That's voluntary. Involuntary is the movement of your stomach, intestines as you digest food. What are the different types of muscle tissue? Skeletal, the striated, means, which means it has stripes. It's used for voluntary movements and it's usually attached to bones. Almost all skeletal muscles are attached to bones, help, hence the term skeletal muscle. Cardiac probably makes you think of the heart. It is found only in the heart. They're striated with intercalated discs, which are special connectors between the cells. They're involuntary, they're found in the heart. Now you can calm yourself, which lowers your heart rate, or you can get excited, but you can't make your heart stop for a moment and then start in the same way you can with other muscles on the outside of your body. Smooth muscle is also involuntary, but this, these are the only ones that don't have striations. You find them in the skin, which helps the hairs on your skin move. Internal organs such as small intestine and stomach, anywhere there's movement you don't control and it's not in your heart, got to be smooth muscle. Okay, this shows you skeletal muscle here under the microscope. This is Cardiac muscle, notice the branches and the intercalated discs. That's what connects them to each other. And then smooth muscle is here. Nervous tissue. This is what nervous tissue looks like. You find it in your brain, spinal cord, your nerves. Sometimes termed neural tissue or neurons. Now, neurons and nerves are not the same thing. We'll get to that later. Consists of neurons or nerve cells and glial cells. Now, you see these little dots on the outside of the big black cell, nerve cell? All the little dots that you see on the outside are called glial cells, which are helper cells. Neurons. 
These are nerve cells. They detect stimuli, which is something that's going to cause a change into the tissue. They process information quickly and rapidly transmit electrical impulses in the form of action potentials from one region of the body to the other. So, for example, from your skin to your brain or from your brain to your muscles. They have a prominent cell body. It functions in control, information processing, storage of certain chemicals, and retrieval. Internal communication all happens in the cell body. Neurons. Processes that extend from the nerve cell body, there's two basic types. The dendrite has sig signals coming in from other cells or from the surrounding tissue, and axons are always outgoing cells from the neuron. So if a signal is leaving a neuron, it's going through the axon. If it's coming into the, uh, into the neuron, it's coming through the dendrite. Okay, that's it for chapter four. Um, I'm going to close this, and then we will go directly to chapter five. So uh, today is four and five, and we're moving now to five, which is integument, our skin. And I believe this is the first chapter where we're going to have um, an essay uh, uh, regarding it. And I'll talk about the essay when we get to it. Integumentary system, basically your skin. Okay, this is a picture showing a diagram of the different parts of the skin. Take a look at it. We have hairs coming out, blood vessels. These are the muscles that cause your hairs to stand up. We have nerve tissue in here. And then down below, we have adipose tissue and blood vessels. So take a look at this. The integument, the skin that covers your body is called the, your integument. Skin is also known as the cutaneous membrane. So it's a massive membrane, but it's still a membrane. Interesting thing about the integument, it is the largest and heaviest organ in the body. So your skin, if you took that all off and Stretch it out, weight it, biggest, heaviest organ. The integumentary system consists of the skin and its derivatives. So derivatives means anything embedded in the skin. Nails, hair, sweat glands, and sebaceous glands make up the integumentary system, which we call what we normally call our skin. Skin is the body's largest organ. I mentioned that. Its surface is covered by an epithelium that protects underlying body layers. So your epidermis is part of your skin. That's the outermost layer and that is primarily dead tissue. The connective tissues contain blood vessels that provide nutrients and provide strength and resilience to the skin. Smooth muscle controls both blood vessel diameter, whether that controls whether blood goes through your skin or goes away from your skin, and hair position. You guys have ever had goosebumps? That's when the hairs pull and lift the hairs up. Um, interestingly, that is actually a very primitive reaction to being cold or being creeped out, but most commonly is being cold. Now, some animals, they have lots of fur. When their hair goes from being flat to standing upright, it increases their insulation, makes them warmer. Now, the hair on our arms isn't thick enough to do that, and yet we still have that reaction to cold. The hairs move up. When the hair moves up, some skin moves up with it, and that's the goose bump that you see. That can also happen as a result of being scared, but that happens as because we are distantly related to animals with thicker fur, that uh, when they do raise those hairs, it does give them more insulation against the cold. Okay, uh, neural tissue uh, supports and monitors sensory receptors in the skin. So we have sensory cells in our skin that pick up information about our environment. More function of the skin. It can protect us from abrasion, which is scraping chemicals and pathogens. So chemicals, for example, any toxic chemical on the surface of your skin, believe it or not, you get a lot of protection against those. Uh, for most chemicals, pathogens. So for example, uh, bleach. You get bleach on your skin. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't cause damage as long as you get it off pretty quickly. You're not going to have a lot of, of uh, damage to the underlying tissue. And then pathogens would be microbes that would want to cause disease. Now, even though we sweat, one of the functions of the skin is to prevent water loss. The underlying tissue is very wet, but we only give off as much water as we want to. And that's a lot less than would be the case if we didn't have skin at all. Temperature regulation, heating and cooling. So when you're hot, you send more blood to your skin, which dumps it to the surface to get rid of it. And when you're cold, you move blood away from the surface so you don't become hypothermic, overly cooled. One of the jobs of the skin is to produce vitamin D, which helps with calcium absorption. Now, you can't get calcium out of your food without vitamin D, and that vitamin D is produced in our skin as we get exposed to the sun. So interesting connection there, and then one of the essays we're going to be talking about later. Immune defense, which are white blood cells, sensory reception, which are nerve cells, and we also are able to excrete waste such as uh, urea 
and excess salts in our sweat. But one of the main functions of the sweat is to just cool us. As the liquid goes across our surface, wind blows across it, cools that surface, any blood going through that cooled skin gets cooled off and is sent back to your working muscles in, in a similar way how a radiator moves fluid from the radiator back to the engine, which is generated. Okay, there's two distinct layers. Uh, you guys have heard of the epidermis. Well, you also have a layer below it called the dermis. A layer of stratified squamous epithelium is called the epidermis. Now, interestingly, not all the cells in the epidermis are dead, only the outermost ones. I'll show you in a picture. A deeper layer of dense, irregular connective tissue is called the dermis. That's why you find blood vessels. This is also why you find the living uh, secretory cells or excretory cells, such as your sweat glands and your uh, sebaceous glands. Deep to the dermis is a layer of areolar and adipose connective tissue called the subcutaneous layer hypodermis. So you find fat cells under there and some connective tissue there. Okay, so this is the epidermis. This is just the epidermis. Now, notice that there's different shapes. At the top, of stratum corneum, they're flat, dead cells. But as we move further and further down, you can see they stop being flat and dead and start being alive. How do you know that these cells are alive? This layer here, see right here, this is mitosis. This is a living cell. You cannot have any cell division in dead cells. And that leads me to a common misconception. People say, well, your hair continues to grow after you die. That's not true. Your hair does not. So why does it appear that your hair continues to grow after you die? Well, it turns out our hair, our skin is fairly thick. So for example, if a man shaves and then he dies, as after we die, a lot of the moisture in our skin evaporates. So if the skin is this thick and the hair is this, my finger is the hair. And as the liquid or water starts to evaporate out of dead skin, the, thin, the skin thins and now it appears that the hair has grown because the hair is sticking out. That is not growth of hair after death. It's just the hair poking out of thinner dead skin. So this proves that these lower layers of the epidermis are alive because cell division can only occur in living cells. So all this area below this kind of dark purple is alive. You see living uh, nerve cells in there. Uh, these are tactile or Merkel cells, which help sense uh, sensations. And so what happens is these cells start moving upward and outer layers get shed. So these layers push upward and become the outermost layers. Okay. This is showing uh, thick skin, like on the bottom of your feet, lots and lots of stratum corneum or outermost dead layer. But on the, for example, on the surface of your, uh, of your face, your lips, let's say, very thin stratum corneum, not as much protection needed as the bottom of your feet. Your epidermis, it's the outermost layer of your skin. It's composed of many layers of flat keratinized cells. Now, keratin is a protein that makes up most of the cell, the flat cells of these outermost layers of your epidermis. So keratinized means full of keratin protein. It's composed of several strata or layers. So strata means a layer. Stratum is one layer, strata many layers. Now the epidermis has no direct blood supply. So the deepest layers receive nutrients from the dermis through diffusion. And the further they make their way up, the more likely they are to be dead because they're further away from their nutrient source. But the lower levels get plenty to stay alive. It's just the outermost layers that are dead, flattened, keratinized, squamous cells. Okay, what are some of the different layers? Stratum basal or germanotivum, these are two terms for the lowermost or deepest layer of the epidermis is composed of living cells, as I showed you in the picture. Contains cells called keratinocytes, which produce keratin, melanocytes, which produce melanin or the color of our, of our skin and Merkel or tactile cells. The next layers when moving upwards or away from the deep part. It's called stratum spinosum because it looks under a microscope like spiny. Stratum granulosum contains granules. These granules, uh, when stained, look color, dark, darkened in color. And that's why it's called granulosum because of these granules that can be stained under a microscope. Stratum lucidum means clear, lucid means clear. So it's a clear layer. And then the outermost layer we saw being very thick on the bottom of our feet is the stratum corneum. Corneum meaning horn-like. Um, it's superficial, dead, flattened cells that contain large amounts of keratin. This is really what protects us, the outermost layer of our skin. And those uh, skin cells shed um, and are replaced from below. Skin color. Now, we're going to talk quite a bit about skin color. I may ask you to tell me about how skin color is formed. So there may be an essay associated with this. You want to take 
detailed notes here, pause and rewind and take more notes about it. Okay, living skin or dermis contains blood vessels. That's part of what gives our skin color. The fat, I don't know if you've ever seen a dead body, but they look kind of grayish. Now, why do they look gray? Because the blood vessels don't have actively flowing blood anymore. And that blood going through our skin gives us that pinkish uh, color to living cells. Hemoglobin is a red oxygen binding protein present in red cells and that gives us part of our skin color. Melanin is a pigment produced and stored in cells called melanocytes. So people who have no, more melanin in their skin tend to be darker skin. People with less melanin tend to be lighter skin. What can affect the amount of melanin? Well, it can be exposure to UV light. So people with kind of medium skin tones can get darker as a result of exposure to UV light, what we call getting tan and genetic predisposition. People who are really, really, really pale may not be able to produce much more melanin or people who are really, really, really dark can't produce much more because they already have the maximum amount. Carotene is one of the um, one of the pigments that you find in uh, skin, and it comes primarily from the diet. A good example of that is carrots. It comes from carrots. Uh, let's see. I don't know if we can do this video, but you do have this PowerPoint, so I really want you to check out the video. I don't. I, I hope this video, this uh, link, still works. But when you go back and rewatch this, notice that the PowerPoint is available. So I want you to check out the cool video and you need to take notes on this because I'm going to ask you what they talk about in the video. So when you open up the PowerPoint, click on the link, watch the video, pause, take notes, because you're going to need to know quite a bit about it, about that to do the essay on skin color. OK, so here it is. I hope this is still the correct link. If it's not, I need you guys to let me know. It should be a video talking about how skin color works and how skin color varies as we move from the equator where people tend to be darker skin to more pale skin as we move further from the equator, at least back before people moved around so much. So this is the essay. I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly. So take notes. What do skin color, latitude, folate, vitamin D and milk have to do with each other? Many of these components are explained in this, in this video. You want to take detailed notes. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. And the remainder of the detail that I'm looking for in this essay will come from this video. So you got to watch it. Okay. What your skin color, latitude, folate, vitamin D, and milk have to do with each other. So take notes. Here's one of your essays. Skin color. Okay. Why do people whose ancestors come from more equatorial, that means closer to the equator, tend to be darker skin? For example, African-American people. Uh, darker Asian people, um, Native American people closer to the equator tend to have darker skin. That's what latitude means. Latitude means how far from the equator you are. People whose ancestors come from northern reaches, let's say Sweden, Norway, you know, northern uh, Russia tend to have paler skin. And why is that the case? Well, take notes. It turns out that uh, having skin color can be both a benefit and a problem because, as I told you guys earlier, the ability to absorb calcium that we need for our physiological functions, such as blood clotting, nerve function, and the building of our bones, we can't get that calcium without having vitamin D. And the main way that we get vitamin D is producing it in our skin. So the more pigment that we have in our skin, the less ultraviolet light from the sun hits our skin, making vitamin D. So you might ask yourself, why not just then have completely pale skin so we can get all the light, all the sunlight that we want um, and make plenty of vitamin D. We've also heard that having too much sun can be damaging to your skin. What most people believe is the main damage to your skin is the presence of skin cancer. And that's, that is a thing. But the problem with that concept is that most people get skin cancer after they've reproduced. So having skin cancer is not something that is going to really slow you down from having kids. This usually happens after you've had kids. The main problem with too much sun, believe it or not, is folate. That's a chemical in your skin that's responsible for you being reproductive, the ability to have kids. Without folate, it's more difficult to have kids. And it turns out if you have too much sun, it's going to destroy the folate, which is going to make it hard for you to reproduce. So then you might say, well, then why don't we all have very, very dark skin to protect the folate? Well, too dark of skin for the amount of sun that you get 
is not going to let enough ultraviolet light come through and you won't make the vitamin D that you need. So you see, it's kind of like a teeter-totter. You want enough melanin, enough skin color to protect your folate. Now remember, it's not protecting against skin cancer per se, protecting the folate. And that's in that video. You guys got to watch this video. So the folate is what needs to be protected, but you want to have enough light coming through so that you produce vitamin D for calcium. You guys see the, the teeter-totter here? So people whose ancestors, and it doesn't mean these people are from there. It means their ancestors are from there, from the equa equatorial regions, tend to have darker skin because the sun is more intense there, more likely to cause folate damage. And people whose ancestors are from more not northern climates, northern Europe, Alaska, places like that, tend to have paler skin because in, in those northern climates, you want to have as pale skin as possible to let the limited amount of sun that's going to hit you turn it into vitamin D. In the equator, it also tends to be warmer. People wear less clothes traditionally. If we're going back way, way back when people were evolving. You want, a more, you want more protection in those areas. So you want darker skin, plenty of sun. You want to protect the folate. In the northern climates, you want what little sunlight comes to get through so you make vitamin D. And that is all explained in that video. Okay. Now, the next thing, we talked about vitamin D being necessary. And you only get that from sun hitting. Folate is necessary. It has to be protected. What does milk have to do with it? Well, think about what our ancestors in this country did. We often were farmers, right? So we're outdoors a lot. What do kids mostly do all day now? Well, they sit in the classroom, right? So people had this notion that what we should do is put vitamin D in the milk. And then since the kids aren't running around outdoors all the time, that they're going to need extra vitamin D and the calcium that's in milk. And it's pretty logical. It makes sense. It turns out it doesn't really work that way, but it's kind of supposed to. The vitamin D and the calcium in milk is not readily absorbed very well by the body. So that was kind of a well-intentioned idea. But the reason why kids were given milk is because they used to be outdoors making their own vitamin D so they could absorb calcium from their food. But since they're sitting in a classroom now, they need to have it given to them art, uh, artificially. And that's where milk in school diets came from. They found out that it's not as effective as they thought it was. What's really more effective is letting have ki kids have more playtime. So can you teach kids while they're on the playground? You absolutely can. European countries do it a lot. They have a lot of outdoor time instead of sitting their bottoms in, in classrooms. Interestingly, part of what putting kids in classrooms all day was to do was to get kids used to working all day in an office or in a factory. And we still kind of do that, but we are moving past that. Okay, so let's go to these other questions. Who is it most at risk for folate deficiency? Folate deficiency means you've gotten too much sun. So that'd be someone who goes out in the sun with pale skin. That's why pale skin individuals have to be extra careful to put on sunblock so that A, they don't get cancer, but the key is folate deficiency, which means it's harder to have babies. And for vitamin D deficiency, that would be dark-skinned individuals who are spending a lot of time indoors or very northern climates, not getting enough sunlight to produce the vitamin D they need. So you might say, well, why don't people just take vitamin T D supplements? Makes sense, right? It turns out vitamin D, sup vitamin D supplements don't absorb very well, ironically, and so you don't get much out of it. So what is the best way to make vitamin D in the sun? But you need to do it in a way that's not going to cause a folate deficiency or skin cancer. So it's really about uh, measuring the amount of sun. And it can also help with mood. Going out in the sun for a few minutes to 10 minutes can really improve your mood. We're going to talk a little bit about SAD or seasonal affective depressive disorder later on. So get the rest of the details besides what I just told you from this video. And please let me know ASAP if this video link does not work. And then I will, uh, I'll find it again and, um, and send it to you through, through uh, Canvas email. Okay, talk about friction ridges. They're found in the fingers, palms, soles, and toes. And so what do we mean by friction ridges? This is what we call our fingerprints. Now, when I ask my students, my students in class, live students, what do we have fingerprints for? They very humorously say, oh, so the police can find you if you commit a crime. Well, that's not why we have them. We don't have them so that police can find you. We use that characteristic of our skin for law enforcement. 
And we give those up at the DMV when we get our driver's license. So friction ridges aren't there for identification. They can be used for that because they're unique to each person, but we have them to grasp onto objects. Our fingers don't have any suction cups on them like an octopus does. So how do we hold on to very smooth objects like a glass? Well, it turns out your fingerprints act kind of like a gecko's uh, foot. It allows you to stick onto things that you wouldn't be able to without them. They find them on the fingers, palms, soles, and toes. They're formed from large folds and valleys of the dermal and epidermal tissue. Now, why are they so unique? Well, it turns out that genetics don't control how those friction ridges form, and each person forms them on their own in the womb, and they, they're unique. So what's interesting is even identical twins have different fingerprints because it's not completely genetically controlled. It's controlled by random forming of these ridges. So even identical twins have different fingerprints. It helps us grasp objects and they increase friction so that items do not slip easily from our hands. So think about it. If you grab a glass and it's like this, and it's right straight up and down. If you didn't have your fingerprints, just slip right out and would break. And this helps us grasp objects and was the same for our ancestors. Our feet do not slip on the floor when we walk, even when it's wet and this is really, really slick, and that would prevent the friction ridges on our feet from working. Even our ancestors needed to be able to grasp objects with our smooth fingers and not let them fall. Okay, there's a good example of one. These are the different characteristics or components of a fingerprint. Friction ridges can leave noticeable prints on touch surfaces. What is left behind? Remember I told you sebum or oil is produced by the sebaceous glands? Well, that's what's on the surface of your skin. And then when you touch a smooth surface, that oil gets transferred. And if you put fingerprint dust onto there, it will stick to that oil and then can be used to identify the person. Each individual has a unique pattern of friction ridges, even identical twins. Fingerprints have become a valuable tool for enforcement in identifying individuals. Interestingly, more important now is DNA, but uh, when they first discovered that each person had their own unique one, this was a great way for law enforcement to find someone. Well, if you put on gloves, it prevents all of those from being uh, delivered. And so that's one way to not leave fingerprints. Skin markings. This is a good example of a skin marking. This is called a port wine birthmark. A scientific term for a mole. I have quite a few moles. They're called ne uh, nevus. Uh, freckles are concentrations of pigment. Hemangiomas are areas where blood vessels are swollen. So uh, there's two different types. There can be capillary hemangiomas, which are strawberry colored birthmarks, usually kind of a pinkish colored small birthmark. And then you can have cavernous hemangiomas or wine stains. This is where large areas of the skin fill up with blood, leaving that much darker color. What are the different layers of the dermis? It's composed of cells of the connective tissue proper and primarily of collagen fibers, although both elastic and reticular fibers are also present. So the reticular fibers give you that three-dimensional strength. The elastic fibers allow your skin to snap back when it's been stretched. Other components of the dermis are blood vessels, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, hair follicles, nail roots, sensory nerve endings, and muscular tissue, especially smooth muscle. We saw all of those in the image at the beginning of this, uh, this lecture. What are the two major regions of the der dermis? The upper or more superficial is called the papillary layer. Papillary means finger-like. So these little finger-like projections contain dermal papillae, which increase the surface area contact with the epidermis. Now, why is that important? Because more surface area allows for more diffusion of nutrients from the lower vascular dermis up into the epidermis. It contains blood vessels, which nourish the epidermis. Now, below that is called the reticular layer. It's made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. That's web-like fibers. Collagen fibers give it strength and its ability to stretch. What are some lines of cleavage? What does cleavage mean? The ability to split. The tension lines in the skin identify the predominant orientation of collagen fiber bundles. Now, if you've ever seen wood, how it has like fibers, you can split wood along its uh, grain, it's called. Well, it turns out we have grain in our skin. Collagen fibers have a granular or grain-like orientation. Clinically and surgically significant because cuts can result in slow healing and increased scarring if you cut across the lines. If you cut with the lines, it's going to be a faster healing. Let me show you a picture. Now, notice this is these are the uh, orientation of the collagen fiber bundles. So notice it's going to be more difficult to heal if you go across the collagen fibers because it's going to want to separate this way. But when you go 
with the collagen fibers, this is going to heal more quickly than this. So interestingly, think about what would be the best way to cut for a uh, for a cesarean section. For the skin itself, it would be V-shaped, but women almost never get a V-shape. Why do they get the straight line right here, right above their pubic mouth? Well, it turns out it's for um, it's for looks. It's so that uh, when a woman, after having kids, is on the beach in her bikini, she doesn't have to see a big V-shaped scar. So it's so that um, it can be hidden underneath the bikini or underneath the underwear lines. But for the, just for the skin healing, a V-shape would be better. Interestingly, even these V-shape would cut across the muscle fibers, uh, sometimes making the healing of cesarean sections more difficult. Okay, moving on to innervation and blood supply. The dermis has an extensive innervation, which means nerve supply. It monitors sensory receptors in the dermis and epidermis, controlling both blood flow and glandular secretion rates. So what is vasodilation? That's blood vessels opening up, allowing more blood to go through. But blood vessels expand, more blood flows through an area. What effect is there on thermoregulation? That means the ability to control the temperature. Well, when you open up blood vessel, more blood glow, more warm blood goes through that area and dumps the heat into that skin and onto the surface. So this is what would happen. Vasodilation is what would happen if you are overheated and you want to get rid of excess heat. And for example, if you're exercising. In vasoconstriction, blood vessels narrow to a much smaller size, less blood going through, less loss of heat. This is what would happen if you were cold. Tactile corpuscles and tactile or Merkel cells are found there. We perceive touch sensations and work with a variety of other sensory nerve endings in the skin to give us our sense of touch. Nails, fingernails and toenails. They're scale-like modifications of the epidermis that form on the dorsal surfaces of the tips of the fingers and toes. They protect the exposed distal tips and prevent damage or distortion during jumping, kicking, scratching, or grasping. Their hard derivatives form from the stratum corneum layer of your epidermis. So that's why we have fingers. In terms of fingernails are more than this. It's for scratching itches and for using as tools. We use our fingernails as tools a lot. Uh, even our ancestors did. And this is a good example. The lunula is, uh, the cuticle is below that. Lunula sounds a little bit like luna. It looks kind of like a quarter moon. There's the nail groove, the nail body, and then the cuticle often gets pushed back during a what is it called, a manicure. And if you do a cross section of that, you can see the various parts of a fingernail there. Hair, it's found almost everywhere on the body except the palms of the hands, the sides and soles of the feet, the lips, sides of the fingers and toes, and some of the external genitalia. Now, they used to tell people that if they masturbated, they'd get hair on their palms, and it's not true. That's a, a falsehood to get people to stop doing that back in the day. Most of the hairs on the human body are on the general body surface rather than the head. So we think of our head as having the hair, right? But across all of our skin, if you look really, really closely at these little peach fuzz hairs, not so much for me on my lower face because I have a beard, but if you look on forearm here, my forehead, anybody thinks that other than these places, they don't have any hair. You just haven't looked closely enough because there are tiny little uh, peach fuzz hairs there. Most of the hairs, okay, got that. All right. So this is what a hair is built like. This, this is the muscle that can put, lift it up or lay it down. There's the oil gland next to it. And then you can see various parts of the hair there. There's three kinds of hair. During our lives, we produce three kinds of hair. The lanugo or peach fuzz hairs cover the majority of the body surface. So wherever it doesn't look like hair. Now I'm not talking about my arm where you can actually hear, see hairs sticking up. It's the parts where you can't see. So for example, your forearm or your face, your forehead, you actually have little hairs there. That's called lanugo hair. The vellus is the arm and leg hair because that doesn't continue to grow longer and longer. But terminal hair is everywhere that hair would grow where it just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. So for example, the top of your head or men's beards. Those are called terminal hairs because they can keep continue to grow indefinitely. Now, one exception to that, and it's kind of a little bit of a interesting little exception. Because of the thickness of chest hair and pubic hairs, those are also called terminal ha hairs, even though those don't grow uh, you know, infinitely long without a haircut of those. It has to do with the thickness of it. Okay, what is hair for? Well, it's protection from sunburns. Keep the top of your head from getting sunburned. <laughs> it can prevent dust in the eyes. That's your eyelashes. 
And inside your nose, you have hairs in your nose to keep bugs from crawling in that. Remember, our ancestors slept on the ground and you wouldn't want bugs crawling all up in your nose. Not every person lived in a house outdoors. All right, heat retention, it helps keep our heads warm. We have clothing around us, but our heads are exposed. Facial expressions, our eyebrows, see when you raise your eyebrows, it shows that you're surprised. Sensory reception, that's one of the reasons why we still have hairs all over our skin. So if there is a bug crawling on you, you can feel it. Visual identification. So we style our hair in different ways to say things about us. For example, some women will go from having long curly uh, hair to much shorter hair when they become moms because it's easier to take care of. Not so interested in finding a new mate that, like younger women are. And any expression that we want of our personal, uh, personal characteristics can often be given by our hair. Um, chemical signal dispersion. Now, I, this is another potential essay and I will talk about it right now. So be ready to take some notes on this. It turns out that some of the sweat in your armpit and crotch is, uh, contains food molecules. And I told you about that. Now, when that hits the hair, that's normally that now women shave that men generally don't. Our pubic areas, some people shave it, some people don't, but in more primitive society, we wouldn't shave any of it. So that sweat that contains food molecules ends up in this moist, hairy area, and there's bacteria there. Now, it turns out when you mix bacteria and the pheromones, it generates an odor. We don't like to give off that odor because we want to keep our body odor to ourselves. But our ancestors used the odor that came from our armpits and our groin to give information to other people around them. And this is one of the essays. How might our ancestors have used um, armpit sweat and groin sweat uh, to uh, give information. It turns out that the pheromones in there can not only tell someone whether they're related to you, whether they belong in the tribe, but can also give reproductive status. Now, have you ever noticed that teenage boys have a very different odor when they sweat than little boys do? And the same with girls. And so our ancestors didn't bathe. And so when they would move around, the smell from the armpits and groin would come out because humans have a very poor sense of smell. It needs to be pretty strong. And so anybody near you could kind of tell what was going on with you. Are you related to me? Are you reproductively active? Is this somebody who's ready to start having babies? So that, and why do we not do that? Well, back in those days, the people around us were our clan, were the people that we trusted with that knowledge about our personal body chemistry. Nowadays, who do we spend most of our time around? Relative strangers, right? People on a bus, people at work. These are not our intimate members of our clan, not our families. We spend a lot of time away from our families and people that we know intimately. So what we don't want to do is give away a whole bunch of biochemical secrets. So what we women often will shave their armpits. We wash regularly. We put deodorant or antiperspirant on. We put on scents to block any of our body odors. And that's because especially women don't necessarily want to give away their reproductive status to strange men because men act strangely around women often. And so one of the reasons why we don't do it is because we don't want to give our reproductive status away to people that we don't know closely. So we bathe, we put on these smells, we put on deodorant and antiperspirant so that we don't give away that information to strangers. And we did when we were in our clans and we wanted to give that information away. Now, we didn't want to consciously, but biologically we needed to do that so people kind of knew what was going on with us biochemically. It's kind of an interesting thing. That, what I just got done telling you about is a potential essay on the upcoming test. Why does this system not work very well today? Because we bathe and we shave and we put on external odors because we wanna be able to present the odor that we are picking not that's coming from our own internal uh, body chemistry, especially with pheromones. Okay, hair color. It's the result of the synthesis of melanin in the matrix adjacent to the papillae. I showed you a picture of the base of a hair, which is called the papillus. Variations in hair color reflect genetically determined differences in the structure of the melanin. So dark hair, red hair, blonde hair, it has to do with how much uh, melanin goes into it and whether it's carotene or melanin. Environmental and hormonal factors. Now, sometimes you can, environmental factors can cause you to gray earlier. If you're stressed, you can get more gray. Hormonal factors can cause uh, hair to change color. Uh, the diminishment of reproductive hormones can also initiate gray hair production. Interestingly, age, we, many people, like for me, when I was a little kid, 
I was blonde. Then before I got old, I had this kind of dark brown hair and then gray hair. Now the blonde hair happens because even though I have the, the genes for brown hair, it hadn't kicked in yet. So my hair was blonde because the genes that made my hair brown hadn't started producing the brown pigment yet. And now as I'm getting older and older, that brown pigment is diminishing. And now my hair is more and more gray as I get older. So we start off, now this isn't true for every kid, but blonde hair is children, gray hair is adults, and then our main hair color. Uh, it just it kind of depends on the individual. Okay, hair growth and replacement. Sometimes hair loss can be temporary as a result of one or more of the following factors. Some drugs can cause hair loss. Some dietary factors can cause hair loss. Radiation can cause your hair to fall out. Sometimes really severe fever can cause hair loss or stress can cause your hair to fall out. Thinning of the hair is called alopecia and can occur in both sexes usually as a result of aging. Going bald happens usually younger in men than women. And in men, it's male pattern baldness often where there's a patch and women it tends to happen more across the surface of their scalp. That's due to the presence of testosterone. Exocrine glands of the skin. Sweat, or the scientific term is sudoriferous glands, produce a watery solution that performs several specific functions. So merocrine or ecrine, remember these are equivalent terms, are sweat glands that produce a fluid that cools you off when you're overheated and the excretory function of getting rid of excess urea, which is a byproduct of our body chemistry. Apocrine sweat glands, this is what's in your groin and armpit, produce odors in the pubic and axillary regions that may have had a communication function in our ancestors. And I talked about that earlier. Pheromones, the fact that there's hair normally there, the fact that it's protected from drying, the fact that there's bacteria there, it all works together to generate this odor, which gives off information about you, the people around you. Sebaceous or sweat glands produce an oily material that coats the hair shaft and the epidermal, epidermal surface, preventing drying. So the, the oil, interestingly, when we shower, we put shampoo on, we get rid of that oil because it contains dirt and odors. And then we put an artificial uh, oil on it, which is conditioner, right? So the conditioner then acts as the oil on our hair. And then we also wash the oil off our skin. So what do we do? We put lotion on. So the conditioner and lotion is the replacement for the naturally occurring oil produced by the sebaceous glands of our skin. So this shows you a sebaceous, uh, excuse me, American sweat gland. Now, interestingly, I want to show you guys, if it's a regular sweat gland, just a typical sweat gland, notice that the duct goes right off the body surface. This is the sweat that cools you. Now, I was talking about the apocrine sweat gland. This is the kind of sweat gland that you would find in your groin or in your armpit. Notice that the duct to this goes to the hair shaft. So it's a little bit different in structure. This is what would be then going uh, to generate that odor. And then the sebaceous gland also associated with a hair shaft, but a much different uh, shape. Okay, other integumentary glands, ceruminous glands produce earwax and mammary glands. Remember they produce milk in the same way that that material under your arm is produced. Actually, some evolutionary scientists believe that mammary glands are just highly modified armpit sweat glands because they're right next door. So it wouldn't be that hard for your body to move some of those over and turn them into breasts way, way, way back in the day, uh, way, way before people. And believe it or not, even before most dinosaurs, there were mammals. Look it up. All right. And so mammary glands produce milk for babies. Burns. It's a major cause of accidental death, primarily as a result of their effects on the skin. So when you get burned, the fact that your skin's been uh, compromised means it's harder to stay alive usually caused by heat or radiation, some chemicals. Sunlight will never generate more than a second degree burn. Believe it or not, you can't get a third degree burn by sunlight unless you're near the sun and then you'd be dead because you're in space or electrical shock. All right, the immediate threat to life results primarily from fluid loss, that is you lose the ability to retain fluids, infection because the tissue is dying and the effects of burn dead tissue, necrosis it's called. Burns are classified according to the depth of tissue involved. Now what we mean by depth is away from the surface, if it's superficial, deeper, or all the way down. Okay, first and second degree burns are called partial thickness burns because they don't go all the way down to the dermis. They only affect the uppermost layers of the epidermis. Third degree burns are called full thickness burns. First degree burns involve only the epidermis, so doesn't affect the dermis. 
and are characterized by redness, pain, and slight edema, some inflammation. A sunburn is a good example. Most sunburns are first degree burns because there's not usually vesicles or like a little fluid filled uh, sacs associated with it. That's a first degree burn. Second degree, degree, degree burns. Second degree, degree burns involve the epidermis and part of the dermis. So some of the dermis is, uh, is involved. The skin appears red, tan, or white, and blisters form. Usually that's the characterization of a second degree burn. Very painful. A scald from hot water or hot oil is a good example of a second degree burn, and this is what it would look like. Third degree burns are full thickness burns. That means all, almost all of the skin tissue, all the way down to the uh, subdermal tissue has been affected. The destruction of all of this. So often the regeneration can occur, may occur from the edge only due to the absence of dermis and this causes scarring. Skin grafting is required to prevent abnormal connective tissue fibrosis and disfigurement. It turns out there's a new thing. Uh, you guys have heard of tilapia, it's fish. It turns out if you take tilapia skin and put it on a burn, a burn victim, often the huge amount of stem cells in the tilapia skin can help you heal. So look it up, look up on the internet, tilapia skin for burn treatment. I think you might be uh, interested to learn more about that. Dehydration is a major concern because the entire portion of the skin has been lost and water cannot be retained, must be aggressively treated for dehydration. So people with large amounts of third degree burns often have to be on IV fluids because they are gonna be losing a lot of fluid. Okay, what happens as we get older? Skin repair processes take longer due to reduced number and activity of stem cells, so fewer stem cells. Skin forms wrinkles and becomes less resilient. Not only is your skin getting kind of more expanded, but it's less elastic. The immune responsiveness is diminished. Skin becomes drier due to less sebaceous gland activity. And you get spots, hair falls out. It's, it's not fun getting older, folks. Um, my dad used to say, uh, aging is not for wimps. And... Uh, as I'm getting closer to old age, I can sense changes in my skin too. And none of it's good, but it's the natural process. All right, sweat production diminishes, our ability to thermoregulate diminishes. Blood supply to the dermis is reduced, leading to impaired thermoregulation. So older people tend to complain about excess heat, or excess cold, more than younger people. Hair thinning and loss, less vitamin D production. Now that's gonna be a problem because if you're not producing as much vitamin D, you're not getting as much calcium. Bones become more porous. Uh, you guys have heard of osteoporosis, the porosity or weakening of bones, and that can lead to fractures if people fall and the development of skin cancers. Now, remember, we were talking earlier about the skin. Skin cancers aren't the main biological reason why we have to protect our skin. It's the production of folate. Too much sun is going to reduce folate and make it more difficult for us to produce sperm cells or ova successfully. That's why you got to watch that video. Skin cancer, this is an example of skin cancer, most common type of cancer because we get exposed often to a lot of ultraviolet light. Greatest risk from a uh, factor to exposure to UV rays of the sun, excessive amounts. Highest incidence is in people who've had severe sunburns, especially as children. So I've had sunburns before, so I have to keep really close an eye on my skin. My brother has already had several chunks of skin removed that were precancerous. Okay, and that is it for today. Um, since nobody is here, I'm pre-recording this. Uh, I won't be taking any questions, obviously, so I hope you enjoyed this. Please let me know if you have any questions about what I said, and I hope to see you in my next live lecture. Have a great one, guys. Bye now.